Okay, so today we have uh, Dr. Ryan James uh, giving the first talk of this session. And he did his PhD mm. from UC Davis with Jim Crutchfield, then went for about a year. One year, yeah. Older with Liz Bradley, and then he's back again at UC Davis. So he has done some recent discoveries in decomposing Kolmogorov-Sana and dropping it into the suburb bound and ephemeral part, which relates to how much uh, of the future can be predicted from the current state of the system. And that seems to be at least somewhat related to Thomas Young's prediction like ideas that Gavin has worked on. So I'm really interested to learn what's going on and hopefully you can make some things more clear for me. So with that, All uh, right. let the speaker begin. Well, thank you. Uh, and I've never been here before, so this is quite the honor. <laughs> um, yeah, so like uh, Debian Du said, uh, we will be discussing like an information theory decomposition for stochastic processes. But before getting there, I wanted to go through just a whole mess of information theory in case no one knows, uh, or in case you're not too familiar with the way I view information theory, which is probably most people, because um, it's maybe a little odd. So um, right, that window's not selected. There we go. Yeah, OK. So what is information theory? Uh, try to quantify information. It's based on probability distributions. Uh, has no meaning of semantics in it, just how probable is a message or not. Uh, not what the content of said, said message is. And um, so Shannon looked at something that's sometimes called a surprisal, which is just the minus log of the probability of a event. So if you roll a die, every event has one sixth probability. So you plug in one sixth, then you get some amount. That's how surprised you are by any particular outcome, according to this formula. Um, so a few properties of it, sure things convey no information with probability. They have probability one, so there's no information in that. Uh, the impossible is infinitely surprising. And the less likely something is, the more surprising it is. So if you have a highly biased coin, say it comes, he comes up heads 99% of the time, all those, every time you flip it and get a heads, you're not surprised, but the every once in a while that you get a tails, you're very surprised. That's, that's all this is. And then the entropy of a distribution is just the average, the weighted average of the surprise. So how surprised are you on average? And it has several properties, none of which are particularly important right now. Uh, so we can skip those. Um, for fixing notation, I will write that one variable is informationally poorer than another if, that, if it is a function, a deterministic function of this other variable. So basically, if you can take variable y, like say a six-sided die, and map it onto uh, a coin, say by mapping evens to zero or to tails and odds to heads, then the coin is informationally poorer than the die. And then there's just the reverse of that. And then if two things are both informationally richer and poorer than each other, then they're equivalent, informationally equivalent. So any questions on that? One-to-one -one correspondence? Um, basically, it means they are the same random variable up to some kind of isomorphism. Okay. Okay, so why is this, how does this translate to information? Well, if you are informationally poorer than another variable, you have smaller entropy. And if you're informationally equivalent, you have equal entropy. And we'll have a few other constraints show up a little later. So all good so far? OK. So conditional entropy, you just slap a conditional probability in there. Um, and the nice thing is that if you have the entropy of a random variable x, if you condition on some other variable, you only decrease the entropy. And it is still non-negative. Uh, and getting back down to here, if, if x is informationally poorer than y, then the conditional entropy of x given y is zero. Uh, mutual information, we can write it several ways. These will all be important very shortly, so you should be taking notes. Uh, the mutual information is bound from above by the entropy of either variable in it. So. There's a duality with set theory that's nice that will let us use Venn diagrams to visually represent information um, relationships. 
So the entropy is like set cardinality. Uh, joining two variables is like a union. Mutual information type operations are like set intersection. And conditioning is like uh, set uh, subtraction or set difference. Not symmetric difference, but just set difference. So let's do those Venn-like Venn diagrams. So we've got the information in X, which is this circle, information in Y, which is the other. There's some stuff in X that's not in Y, some stuff in Y not in X, and some stuff that's shared by both of them. So the stuff just in X is what's shaded here, or that's in X in total is shaded here. The stuff in Y is what's shaded here. The stuff jointly contained in both variables is shaded here. Just in X, just in Y, and shared, which is the mutual information. And the crescents on either side are conditional entropies. Good question. Yes. If we have three variables, can we have two oh. variable measures in the same way? We will get to that very shortly. So just a few examples real quick to ground things. If we have two fair coins, so their heads and tails equally likely and completely uncorrelated with one another, one another. The joint entropy is two bits, one bit per coin. The conditional entropy of X conditioned on Y is one bit. Y conditioned on X is one bit. And they share zero bits because they are independent. Okay? Uh, if X and Y are always equal, it's very similar, or the exact opposite, sorry. Uh, the mutual information is one bit. And that is the joint entropy. So the joint entropy of one bit is completely contained in their overlap. There's nothing outside of that. Uh, generically, we might have a situation like this where there is different quantities. So three variables. First, um, the standard definitions we had before still hold. So this circle here is the entropy of Z. Uh, this area here outs outside of X is the conditional entropy of Z conditioned on X and so on. But we get into a situation where how should we generalize the mutual information here? I'll go through three different ways of doing so. Uh, the first is the co-information. Uh, I think Tony Bell called it the co-information. Uh, it had been studied as just the multivariate mutual information beforehand. Um, and it is this area where all three variables contribute. Uh, basically, the idea is, like the mutual information, we had, say, just this part, xy over px, py. We extend it by having all even sets of marginals on top and all odd-sized sets of marginals on the bottom. That's how you just extend it. Uh, it is zero if any two variables are independent, and it can be negative, which is difficult to interpret and beyond the scope of this talk, but there are others, and we can talk about it afterwards. Uh, we'll see an example of it very shortly, too. So another way is the total correlation or multi-information, which is the sum of the marginals, marginal entropies minus the joint entropy. So this circle plus this circle plus this circle minus the entire thing. So where two variables overlap is counted once, where three variables overlap is counted twice, and if there were four variables where all four overlap would be counted three times and so on. So that's extended as the kolblick leibler divergence of the joint versus the product of the marginals. Its properties are varied. It's bound from above by n minus 1, where n is the number of variables. Uh, it is zero if and only if all variables are independent. So subsets can be independent, as, but as long as there's any correlation or dependencies between variables, it will be non-zero. And uh, the type of distribution that maximizes it, and we'll see it shortly, is where all variables are identical. So we have, say, 12 variables, and they're all either heads or tails together. And lastly, there's one called the dual total correlation, or here we'll call it the binding information. Um, which is everywhere where there's overlap, but we don't weight them differently. So it's just the joint minus uh, each variable conditioned on all the others. Okay. So we can write it like this. Uh, it is maximized by parity-like distributions. So say sum mod 2 of 
So we add up all but the last variable, and then the, the last one is the sum mod of the, sorry, the first n minus one variables are each independent, and the last one is the sum mod two of the n minus one others. Uh, which is like the XOR where any one is the sum mod two of the other two. Um, Ah, uh, it's the product of the probability of each variable conditioned on all the others. Yeah. So generally somewhat difficult to compute, but it can be done. All right, so, and lastly, we'll discuss the residual entropy, which is just the opposite of the binding information. It's just the entropy contained in variables that are, or the entropy in the variables that is completely unshared. So it's uncorrelated with anything else. In two, uh, in the case of just two variables, it's sometimes called the variation of information. Okay, uh, so it's just defined like this. It's the sum of each, the entropy of each variable conditioned on all the others. Uh, it's maximized when all the variables are independent. Uh, it's minimized when they're all contained with some kind of dependency with the others, and so on. Uh, it's bound from above by the entropy, and so on. So let's look at a few examples. That giant bit distribution I mentioned before. Uh, the co-information is one bit. The total correlation is two bits because this center area is counted twice. The binding information is one bit. And the residual entropy is zero. Uh, for the parity distribution, so this is z is the XOR of x and y. We have that the co-information is minus one bit. The total correlation is one bit. The binding information is two bits. And the residual entropy is zero. So we can walk through where these values come, through, come from real quick. If, if anyone's mildly uncomfortable with this. So we know that if we look at any vid, uh, variable on its own, so for example, just x, uh, it's a fair coin. Zero occurs half the time. One occurs half the time. Same with y, same with z. So each of them should have a total of one bit of information, which we do see here. One minus one plus one. And one minus one plus one, and so on. And furthermore, any two variables, say x and y, x and z, or y and z, are independent. We see zero, zero occurs a quarter of the time, one, one a quarter of the time, zero, one a quarter, and one, zero, one quarter of the time. So they're independent. So that means the mutual information between x and y, which is this region, needs to be zero. So one and minus one, one and minus one, one and minus one. However, the conditional mutual information, which is a quantity we didn't discuss exactly. Uh, so say the mutual information between x and y, given that we know the value of z, is one. So for example, if we know that z is zero, it's either one, one, or zero, zero for x, y. So there's one bit of information shared given that we know what z is. So given that we know what z is, this has to be 1. So given that this has to be 1, but this has to be 0, we know that has to be negative 1. Also, you get it just by grinding through those. All right. You'd get it just by grinding through these probabilities for the joint distribution also. So uh, I guess just another quick example. Um, this is where x and y are identical, but are independent from, or sorry, y and z are, are identical, but independent from x. So x ends up having one bit outside of the other two variables. And y and z share one bit, and it is divorced from x, because it's, these guys are independent from x. So the co-information is zero, total, co total correlation is one, binding information is one, and residual entropy is one. So we'll come back to using at least these three measures shortly. But any questions so far? Nope. Okay, so um, for the rest of the talk, we're gonna be talking about stochastic processes. So just to ground notation and such, yes? Why don't I just advertise? I have a big, huge uh, review thing of all these... Yes. And many, many, many more. And many, many, many more. 
so and there's some good stuff in some ancient space, but you can get all those citations out of that too. So just yeah, uh, it's three. It's a quick few pages, like twelve measures at least per page. <laughs> yes, definitely, definitely. This is just a drop in the bucket compared to what's in that paper. Huh? Sorry, that's three plus one dot com slash info. info. Mm hmm. Yeah, so if you ask good questions, there might be additions to it. Well, no, no. Oh, yes. <laughs> I need those diagrams. Anyway, ah, yeah. I can send you the tics code if you're if you're interested. Are those text from the, the, the Venn? Yes. This is all in. This is yeah, all yeah, compiled yeah. LaTeX. I actually made a note of myself. How do I do Venn diagram and text? Tics. Okay, right. Ah, then, yes. Anyway. Yes. Um, <laughs> so, did you rail things? Continue. Yes. Where was I? Uh, so processes. Uh, basically, they are a shift space endowed with a measure that such that both the shift and the measure are shift invariant. So if you're familiar with symbolic dynamics. Hmm? So I didn't want to follow that. Ah, so we can do this in an entirely different way. We have a chain of random variables. Uh, so these form bi-infinite strings. So any particular realization, we sample this joint random variable, and we get these strings. And it's such that um, if we were to select a different time as time 0, uh, the none of this changes. The probabilities are the same, et cetera. It's stationary. Well, actually, that, that's different. But let's assume it's stationary and ergodic and that these are drawn from discrete alphabets. So can I, can I think of it this way? Like, let's say I have, uh, for simplicity, a Markov process, yep. which is time homogeneous. And yes. uh, it's already in the steady state. And then I start you know, getting the outputs one after the other are the states of the system at each point of time and create a large time series out of it. Can I, can I think of Yes, this? and in fact, even if you started outside of the stationary distribution, uh, I believe this definition would hold. Okay. But we're only going to consider ones that are stationary and stuff, so it is equivalent to having started at the uh, equilibrium distribution. For example, you can have these, um, you can have shift spaces that are what are called um, not irreducible, which are ones, say it's, uh, it's a process where you'd see a bunch of zeros and then a one and then only zeros afterwards. So knowing whether the zero was on the left side of the present or the right side is important. That would, o that would o obey this stuff, but it, it is not stationary or ergodic, so. So it, it may not be reversible in that sense. Right. Most of what we're going to talk about will hold in those cases, but I haven't investigated it at all. So can't say anything too concrete about it. Uh, so, oh, so we're going to call time zero the present. Everything before that we will call the past, and we'll notate with this um, Python slice-like notation. And the future, similarly. So keep an eye out for those colons. Uh, the colors will be consistent throughout also, so that'll help. All right, so uh, we can do that Venn type picture here using these variables. Traditionally, one would look at the past and the present. So how much information does the past tell you about the present will denote rho mu. It's just the mutual, inf mutual information between the past and the present. The information in uh, the present that's not in the past is the entropy rate, Shannon entropy rate, kamalgraf sinai entropy, um, et cetera, et cetera, by whatever name you want to call it. It is the unanticipated information. So we've decomposed the random variable that is the present into the anticipated information and unanticipated information. Okay? Um, where am I going? Oh, let's look at a few examples. So if we had a fair coin, just, uh, so this is a, um, like a Markov chain, it's a hidden Markov model. Whenever we follow this edge, we output a zero, follow this edge, output a one, and we follow those edges with 50-50 probability. Here's an example of a string from one that. All its information is unanticipated because it is independent of the past. If we have a purely periodic process, all of that information is anticipated because uh, once you 
have observed any sequence, you know what the next variable is going to be. Uh, the even shift or even process where we have some arbitrary number of zeros and then a block of even length of ones and then another arbitrary block of zeros and then an even block of ones and so on. Um, it has some anticipated information and a lot of unanticipated information. So for example, if we were observing to right here in the process, we had just seen an even number of ones. That satisfies the requirement. So now we can either see some zeros or more, e more ones in an even amount. So there's unanticipated information in having seen a zero here. We didn't know which it would be. However, if we observed up, had observed up to here, we know the next symbol has to be a one. And so that's anticipated. We can also look at the golden mean process, which is defined as only being able to see, or not seeing consecutive ones. So these ones are always isolated. Again, this has the exact same decomposition as before. See, the values are exactly the same. However, this is a completely different process, very different statistical properties. This one's a Markov chain. This one requires an infinite order hidden Markov model. Um, there are many other differences, and we'll discuss some of those soon. But here, the exact same amount is unanticipated. Basically, whenever we have seen a zero, we could see either a zero or a one. And whenever we see a one, we know we have to see a zero afterwards. Okay, so how do we measure these? Well, they're going to be essentially the uh, asymptotic densities of these extensive quantities. So we can first look at the entropy of just uh, one time series value, so one random variable, or we can look at two, three, or four, and this is the entropy over those four variables. And the density of this, so the limit of this divided by uh, n here, n b four, will give us this h mu value we're interested in. Similarly, if we do the same thing with the total correlation, build it up as we go, the rate at which this grows is the rho mu quantity we're interested in. So if we just calculate these, this total correlation value over increasingly large, larger blocks of random variables from our, our, our observations and look at the growth rate, asymptotically that will converge to rho mu. So using the entropy and the total correlation, we can plot those at say one, two, three, four, five, six variables. The rate at which it grows asymptotically will be <clears throat> h mu, that, in, that rate we're interested in. Similarly, if we plot the total correlation values here, they grow at rho mu. I don't remember, oh, I do know exactly which process this is, but we haven't discussed it. Uh, so basically we just need to plot these things. We can do it from data, just uh, estimating statistics over words of a particular length. Plot, th plot it out to whatever length we can justify by the amount of data we have, put a slope on there, and we get our estimate of Romeo. Or you can build models and calculate these things directly from the hidden Markov model. So either way, purely from data and observations or through model, build model building and inference, either way. So let's add the future into this picture. So like before, we have the present, but this time it's broken into four pieces instead of two. Okay. Um, there's also this component down here, which is non-zero if we're considering anything that's not a Markov chain. Markov chains, the present ob observable is determined by just the immediate past. Here, we might have observations that extend beyond a length uh, two correlation. And so we might have um, this quantity here be non-zero. Okay, so let's focus in on this. And again, we have the anticipated information rho mu, just by cutting through the, the past, and the unanticipated information h mu. But when we cut that by the future here, h mu, the entropy rate, gets broken into two pieces. So both of these are going to be anticipated, 
this piece is anticipated and relevant for future behavior of the time series. We call that the bound information. Unanticipated? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, unanticipated, yes, sorry. Both of these are unanticipated. This piece is unanticipated but relevant for the future. And this piece is unanticipated but irrelevant. So we call this the ephemeral information. Ephemeral and bound. Both of which added together give you the entropy rate of the process. So we have the rate at which basically uncorrelated noise is generated. Or it might be useful, it might not be noise, but it's uncorrelated. And then we have randomness that's generated but is correlated or dependent on other things in the time series. So if you have a random number generator, presumably all of its information generation is ephemeral. However, there have been many studies. There is a uh, famously a study on the Wolf algorithm for modeling Ising models where uh, the random number generator that was built into some programming language had subtle correlations that most statistical tests failed, but it, uh, it caused there to be severe discrepancies near the critical temperature in the Ising model. And hopefully that would have been detected by this being non-zero in the uh, random number generator. But I haven't done that test, so I don't know. All right, so a few more examples, just like before. With a fair coin, all the information is ephemeral. With a periodic process, it's all anticipated, just like before. For the even process, we have the same un uh, anticipated information, and all the un unanticipated information is bound. And we can see that through a very simple little test. Knowing that our pattern is even blocks of ones punctuated by arbitrary blocks of zeros, let's erase any particular symbol, like say this zero here, and ask how often can we fill it in given its context? Well, since there's a zero on both sides, we know this has to be a zero because we can't fit an even block of ones in a single symbol. Similarly, if this zero had been erased, we can't have a block of three ones and then a zero. So this has to also be a zero and so on. Any particular symbol we cover up, we can always fill in based on its context. And therefore, all the information generation is bound. The golden mean process, however, most of its unanticipated information is ephemeral. Only a little of it is bound. And we can see that because if we erase a zero that's next to a one, we know it has to be filled in with another one. But if we re erase any other zero, say in a block of, if this was a zero, the middle of a block of zeros, it could be a zero or a one. And if we erased a one, it could be filled in with either a zero or a one. So much of the time, we can fill, we can fill in a blank with either symbol. Only occasionally are we forced to fill it in with a particular one. Does this make sense so far? All right, so how do we measure these guys? So the residual entropy rate, as we add variables, gives us R mu, the ephemeral information. And that it makes sense that it's ephemeral because each it's the information that's uncorrelated with any, any other variable. It's only information contained on the outskirts here. Whereas the bound information is the rate of the growth rate of the binding information. And we can plot those just like before. The residual entropy curve in blue in darker blue here eventually has a linear asymptote with a slope of the ephemeral information. And the bound information curve eventually has a linear asymptote with a slope of the bound information. So just like before, we can grind through these information quantities just from observables, just from recorded data, and estimate the ephemeral information rate and the bound information rate. Okay, so, so, so okay. yes. So okay, so I got my circle representing the entropy of the present. And you say this part is bound, and this part is ephemeral, and yes. the other part is anticipated. unanticipated. This uh, row mu, or sorry, okay. anticipated. Don't leave me wrong, Alec. <laughs> ah, so it's bound and anticipated. Yeah, let's so go it's back. Like symmetry though between bound and anticipated, isn't that? No, Somewhat, yes. Ah, so 
So if your time series is stationary, you can look at it in either direction and you get the same information quantities. So if instead we had cut through here completely with the future, right. this component here would be equal to this. Because the, yes, the that would be the... Yeah, so you're treating the sum chunk you're treating asymmetrically. Right. Time. Right here I'm considering time is only going in one direction. But we could divide it completely through here with the future and we'd get this uh, ephemeral bound, we'd get another piece of bound here, and a piece we refer to as the enigmatic information here. Enigmatic. Yes. Enigmatic. Mostly, mostly because we have no interpretation of it whatsoever. Sorry, what? We have no interpretation of it whatsoever, so. Well, and sometimes it's negative, we have no idea what it means. Yes, other than, the, other than that, I have no intuition for it, so. Um, but since the... That's the thing that can be negative. Yeah. And a consistent semantic interpretation of negative information is still kind of an open question. There's a whole well. group of people that dislike that so much, they have a different yeah. decomposition of mutual information. Right. So all the components are positive. What's the problem? It just means you're overcounted. Uh, well, <laughs> well, okay, so in the, in the case of that parity distribution we saw earlier, yeah. the negative information in the middle meant that, well, it's often interpreted as meaning that there's some synergistic effect among the various variables. Um, that intuition does not hold beyond three variables, though. So if we had a parity distribution on four variables, the co-information is positive one. And in fact, it's equal to the co-information of the uh, giant bit distribution. So the sign of the co-information um, in uh, with more than three variables uh, doesn't seem to have any semantic meaning. Uh, so Williams and Beer at Indiana recently proposed a decomposition of, um, well, let's go back to the three variable. Uh, this will do. Um, so if you consider the present as a function, or maybe noisy function of the past and future, they decompose this thing, the mutual information between the inputs and the output, into synergistic, redundant, uniquely from the past, and uniquely from the future. So they break these three pieces into four pieces, all of which are non-negative. Um, and it turns out this center piece, the co-information, is equal to the redundancy minus the synergy. So okay, I didn't follow any of that, but <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. We, we can talk about it afterwards. Yeah. Certainly, yeah. Well, so there is some debate in that field. I can give you many references. I mean, different ways you can decompose it, even if it's right. So. So uh, everyone, or most people who have read the paper like the framework idea, but how you actually quantify the redundant information mm -hmm. uh, is kind of up for debate still. Quantifying what's happening? So we've got, we know, we know what this region is, this region, this region, just from um, Shannon measures. We can calculate the quantities that fit here and what the total is. But if we break it into four things, synergy, redundancy, unique from the left or unique from the right, uh, it's underdetermined, so we need to define a function that quantifies one of them to be able to determine the actual values of all of them. And Ugh. there is debate as to what the correct way of yeah. quantifying that is. Okay, let's move on. That's yeah. Cool. Although, you know, some future meetings say months from now we could go through that and talk a little bit about it because it's very interesting. Well, I, I have a talk I could throw up right now, actually. actually but. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> even looking at the amount of information processing and logic gates. Yes, certainly. So almost all of this that we're talking about here is this kind of standard channel communication channel, and just to say it kind of engin engineering language, you have a channel, there's one input, one output. But of course, if we're interested in networks and other kinds of devices, we could be interested in two inputs and one output. And that's where these issues of synergy and mm -hmm. dependency of mm -hmm. inputs and producing the output becomes important. And it's a really interesting topic. And what Ryan is saying is there's actually some really interesting open questions. It's not yep. uh, oddly enough, 50, 60 years after Shannon, it's still open. Mm -hmm. So, so it'd be, uh, maybe a fun discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. Actually, I had one other question. Go for it. Could you go oh. to one of the plots where you show the like asymptote slope? Yes. Um, so the intuition coming right up. There we go. Why things change and then will always asymptote? Is that like, um, is it that on short time scales like? things interact a lot, but then as you keep adding more and more variables, eventually you're just kind of adding like conditional ba uh, Basically the idea is uh, 
two largely distant chunks of your time series, when conditioned on the stuff in between, are independent. Okay. So if you have something where a process where somehow those don't are, aren't rendered independent eventually, even not taken on their own, but conditioned on the stuff in between, uh, then these might not asymptote. I, I haven't looked at that kind of situation though. Is that a result of stationarity or? Uh, no. So stationarity. Sorry, I didn't. Men I meant to mention this. Stationarity would, well, it would make this B mu or bound information and the one that's over here be different. Lack of stationarity. Lack of stationarity. Yeah. yeah. Be due to stationarity, they're equal. Uh -huh. And for an example of where they're not even well defined for non-stationary processes. <laughs> right. Uh, well, because you you can't properly define the x zero variable. Well, yes. Yeah, so so it's then a, a function of x of t. It would have a different b mu depending on where in the right. time series it is. Okay. Yeah. So it, it would be a b mu of t. Yeah. Yeah. So for that even process, if we were to do this division into another bound information and that enigmatic one, we can see here the enigmatic would be zero because we'd be taking two-thirds out of 0.25 whatever, leaving behind negative 0.4 something. So for the even process here, the enigmatic information is strongly negative, and we just don't have an interpretation for that, really. It doesn't seem to be correlated. So the Markov one is, uh, or the even process is infinite Markov order. It can't be represented with a Markov chain of any finite order, uh, but I thought initially that maybe negative stuff was correlated with these infinite Markov things, but it's not. So I, I don't have anything really to say about the negative there. Uh, any other questions? Do, 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 do. Oh, by the way, uh, I've never actually calculated these quantities using this method. Um, these can all be calculated very easily from a hidden Markov model, so I always just get the mo model and then do it. Uh, as we will. S oh, actually, sorry, I misspoke. The data I show in this talk, I did actually get from statistics over like length twenty something words, so like strings. Be I, nope. Oh no, I generated like ten trillion. Oh well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the real world. Exactly. This is all computer it, simulation, it, it, so. However, more recently, I've redone this work and more. Uh, and so the plots we see match with if you actually correctly, analytically get a Markov model at every point. So we'll talk about that in a second. One quick question. Before yeah, yeah. So at one point, you said that there is a symmetry in the bound information in the sense that if I took Fe uh, by infinite series and basically reflected them with respect to the present, then the bound information I get from this reflected series is also going to be the same as the original one. Yes, the, it's uh, invariant under time reversal. Uh, so it does. It does. If you're stationary. What? So consider the case where I get these uh, outputs from a Markov process. Mm -hmm. a simpler case, and that Markov process uh, can be stationary but thermodynamically irreversible. In the yes. Sense that say. I have a simple three-state system, and clockwise rotations are much more likely mm -hmm. compared to counterclockwise. So there is thermodynamic irreversibility, but if I look at bound information, it will not catch that thermodynamic irreversibility. No, it will not. Okay. Just like the the entropy rate is is invariant under time reversal. Also, we have uh, I think other measures that would be sensitive to that. For we can talk about it afterwards. Okay, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, okay, so quick example. How do we get a process, uh, discrete symbol process, from a continuously valued uh, discrete time chaotic map? We use a generating partition. So we take our logistic map, uh, which is basically, let's say we wanted to map the point 0 0.2 by the logistic map. We just apply this function, get some other value out, and then we feed that value back in and keep going to generate a long sequence of symbols. Uh, and what we're going to do is if the, sim the value is in the left half of the interval, we're going to call that a 0. If it's on the right half, we're going to call it a 1. So let's start here at, I have no idea. I think I just chose a random number. That's a 0. If we iterate that forward, this point, 
maps very high up, so close to one, and that's a one. One will map to a very small value back here, uh, which is on the zero side again, and we just keep going and we get some stochastic time series out of it then. And each, blow. okay, so. So, the nice thing is, uh, relating chaotic maps back to the information theory we've been doing, Pessin's relation tells us that the entropy rate of that stochastic process will be equal to the sum of the positive Lyapunov exponents. So for a one-dimensional map, we only have one Lyapunov exponent, and therefore, this entropy rate is equal to the Lyapunov exponent, or zero when we're not chaotic. So this should look, if you're familiar with the logistic map, this should look just like the Lyapunov exponent, which is basically the rate of stretching and divergence in the map, as a function of its parameter, where the equation's given right here. Um, so th this matches, this was calculated from long time series using that method we saw earlier. Um, and it matches the Lyapunov exponent calculations you can do much easier and much faster uh, up to the whole um, negative values then getting truncated to zero. But we can write this as ephemeral plus bound. So let's do that. The blue here is the ephemeral and the green or cyan -y colored one is the bound. So what we see is for this logistic map, we have a total amount of information generation, which varies wildly as a function of the control parameter, but generally trends upward. Um, and inside there, there's a very odd and uh, variable decomposition into ephemeral and bound as a function of the control parameters. We can even see that it looks like the bound information goes to zero at certain locations, which we can blah, blah, blah we can describe whenever there is a chaotic band merging, like right here, or if you look closely here, the bound information goes to zero. We currently don't have a real explanation as to why, though. So what's happening there in the, in the actual dynamics? So what happens is at some particular value, say right here, yeah. the points tend to bounce between this part of the interval and this point. It just bounces back and forth somewhere in here and then somewhere over here, right. somewhere over here, somewhere over here. Um, and where those two intervals meet, for some reason the bound information is zero. That's still an open question as to why. I guess Jim uh, thinks we have an answer, but I, I don't. Um, but the, the logistic map, although very well studied um, and very commonly studied, is a little harder to interpret than the tent map, where the Lyapunov exponent slash entropy right here is known to just be the log of the control parameter. The tent map is like a piecewise linear version of the logistic map. It's just two straight lines, and the slope here is the control parameter. So we can divide it into the bound and ephemeral again, and this is what we get. The little bit of noise right here is due to um, poor statistics when there's very, very low entropy rate. So to get a value over here, I ran the time series for like 10 trillion time steps and then used whatever words. Uh, but this shape and all these values are backed up by doing a more analytic theoretical analysis where you uh, construct a completely accurate hidden Markov model at each value using something called Misarevich points and a bunch of other stuff. And we can get into that later. It's not really important. Just know that the values you get by doing the st statistics match an analytic analysis. So what we see here is that the decomposition is still really weird. It goes to zero again where these um, bands merge together, which happen to be at, uh, so the square root of two, the fourth root of two, the eighth root of two, the 16th root of two, and so on. Um, interpretation of this is still somewhat forthcoming. Uh, what we do know is that if, say, you wanted to generate random numbers with your chaotic map as, um, one might want to do in various situations. You would want to do it at one of these band mergings where all the information is ephemeral and there's no 
uh, statistical correlation, at least in the entropy generation. There might still be anticipated information, but that's generally easier to factor out than um, having to worry about breaking up the actual information generation into generating um, uncorrelated variables versus somewhat correlated variables. Um, also, uh, I guess many people derided chaotic, uh, chaotic systems like this as just dredging up randomness in the initial conditions. And this shows that that is not the case. The amount, it, it doesn't just generate um, randomness or uncertainty from your initial conditions. There is some intrinsically dynamic sort of structure in the information generation. So similar? It is. Uh, I have some vague plots that will show that, but uh, I don't have a good one. Here, hold on. We'll come back to that in a second. Uh, yeah, so, if you. Yeah, so if you divide uh, the bound information by the actual entropy rate, these things kind of map onto each other height wise. And if you rescale them according to 1 minus root 2 and root 2 minus root 4 and so on, then they land right on top of each other. But for some reason, I don't have that plot right here. Um, so one more example is there is a two-dimensional analog of the tenth map known as the Lozy map. So this we have two different chaotic par or parameters in the chaotic map, which is the equation of which is down here somewhere. Uh, and we can break that again into this uh, ephemeral and bound information. And in fact, we have a really nice movie of it, which I had forgotten about, but I have right here somewhere. Uh, one second. So the movie will be horizontal slices through this picture that will move upward. If it loads. So. Okay, so. We're starting at the bottom where the attractor was very narrow and going upward. This is the bifurcation diagram again, the bound information and the ephemeral. And we're just slowly increasing the B control parameter, which was the, the one that varied vertically. And right there, we get something isomorphic to the 10th map. And see, we had those, that self-similar shape again. And now as we're moving into the upper half of the picture, things are getting weird again. Although this value is still 0 for some reason, unknown as of yet. And then that's just, uh, oops. so. So it started out small as we move this way. And then right here at b equals 0, we recover the tent map, which is this horizontal slice here. And then we continued up, and then it tailed off there. It's just another case. So if we were using the Lozy map to generate random numbers, we would not want to be in this region or this region of control space. We would want to probably be over here somewhere. Somewhat underrated. Um, yeah. Because you have like two parameters here. And yeah. E, mm -hmm. and you're changing them in real time, and perhaps slowly. Do you have geometric effects? Like um, Each of those frames was generated by um, keeping it fixed. OK, OK. Yeah. okay so you're not really dynamically varying these No, parameters. no, no. Okay. It was just keeping it static several at several different values and then stitching images together. Okay, okay. Yeah. Did you always start with the same initial condition? Uh, I believe so, and I believe it was chosen randomly. Oh, okay. The last state from one parameter setting to be the initial condition of the next, there would actually be the effects you're talking about. Yes. To be able to hysteresis in a different basins of attraction. Right. There's, there's memory in these things. Hmm. But if, you, if you're resetting, you know, yeah. choose zero zeros each time. Then. So, and then just a quick, um, we can plot ephemeral versus bound information, and get a phase portrait kind of thing. So we see if we want uh, 
very high bound information for some reason, it has to come with a fairly large amount of ephemeral. You can't have all bound, no ephemeral kind of picture. And we can do the same thing for the tent map here. Wait, you can uh, get large bound with no ephemeral? Yeah. Not oh, you, oh, not for this particular Not map. not from a cha this chaotic system. So okay. some people look at building computer circuits using chaotic systems. Uh, and if say you wanted for if, if it turns out that the bound information is uh, dynamically useful for computation or something. So if you wanted to engineer a system with large um, bound information and you were using one of these maps to do so, you would have to do some trade-off between ephemeral and bound. You can't just tune it to have large bound and low ephemeral. That just doesn't exist. Uh, and then we saw that plot already and that's the end. So thank you. This is my favorite picture, so let's put on this one. Although I've got a slightly better version.